Hello everyone, my name is Eugene Chung and I am the founder and CEO of Penrose Studios. Uh, I also have the, um, the great honor of going last tonight, so I, I can't wait to dive in and talk about virtual reality. Um, I'd like a show of hands actually, how many people here have tried virtual reality before? You guys could raise your hands. Oh great. And how many have not tried virtual reality? Please raise your hands. Wow, just a, just a couple, we'll have to, we'll have to solve that uh, before the end of the day. Um, well, it's, it's such a pleasure here to be talking, talking with you and speaking with you about my journey as an entrepreneur as well as an artist and talking about how we created Penrose Studios uh, as well as our virtual reality films and stories. Um, so before I dive into that, uh, I'd love to of course talk about, um, uh, talk about something uh, from my past. How did I get into virtual reality storytelling and how did we start uh, Penrose? Um, and I'll talk a little bit about the beginning for all of us. And it, I feel like a beginning for all of us comes back to our parents. Um, and I've had the fortune to have parents who come from two very, very different worlds. Uh, they actually come both from Korea. I was born in America, in Virginia, but they both came from Korea. My mother was born in Daejeon, and my father was born in Gwangju. And, uh, and they are very, besides being from two different provinces in Korea, they also uh, come from two different worlds. So my mother is a CPA, a certified public accountant, and my father is an opera singer. So he actually sings operas. So I've always had the benefit of having a career uh, identified by left brain, right brain, this duality of creative as well as analytical energies. Um, and that's marked uh, most of my career. So I've been everything from a software developer, uh, somebody in computer, uh, and computer development, as well as uh, I've been a filmmaker, so working at places like Pixar, as well as making independent films and things like that. I've always wondered, since I was very young, growing up in the suburbs of Virginia, I did notice that a lot of my friends and kids who were growing up, they didn't really watch opera. So, you know, my father would go and sing operas, uh, but my uh, friends did not. In fact, what they did was they went to go watch television, they went to go watch movies. Uh, nowadays, they'd go and watch videos on YouTube. But what they didn't do was go to the stage play or go see the opera. And so from a very early age, I had this really interesting realization that art forms change over time. So what I mean by that is 150 years ago, when people thought of entertainment, mass entertainment, they thought of this, right? They thought of the opera and things like that. And it's a very interesting thing to think about because when you think about um, back 150 years ago, people like Richard Wagner, a great opera composer, had words like uh, the ideal work of art. That was actually a phrase that many uh, followers of Wagner and opera said of opera because it had the best characters, the best stories, uh, the best music. Um, how could anything get beyond opera was a big question that people had. Then, of course, this was the 1850s, so a few decades later, people uh, came and invented the first moving pictures, uh, and that changed everything. So how many people here, and like by a show of hands, know what this is? How many people here have seen this? Great. And how many people have not seen this or don't know what this is? Okay, just, just a few. A, few. a bunch of undecideds here. Um, so what this is, is this is actually the very first movie uh, that was ever created, uh, that at least that we have a record for. Um, this was by the Lumiere brothers, and it was uh, called A Train Coming Into a Station in France. Now, the big thing about this movie is it's really interesting. It's black and white, it is low fidelity, um, it has very low resolution, and it's very short. It's only about 45 seconds long. Um, and yet, this movie was apparently so exciting that when people saw it on a screen like this, people literally, in audiences like yourselves, ran away from the screen 
because they thought it was so scary to see such an amazing thing. And I feel like that's how people feel about virtual reality today. People look at virtual reality and they see this amazing instrument to do something. To, it, it arises so many emotions, but no one really yet knows what to do with it, right? They are, we're still in the process of making some of the early experiments. And this is the best analogy and the best metaphor for what it's like to work in virtual reality today. So uh, continuing the story and continuing the path so I always realized that art forms change, but I never thought I'd live to see the day that we would see that transformation. We've had the stage play for thousands of years, from the days of old Greek theater. And we've had the opera for hundreds of years, and we've had cinema for 120 years. Uh, this to this year, 120 years, when this movie was made. Um, and so I thought the chances of me seeing that next transformation in my lifetime were slim to none. So that's why I was making movies the normal way and uh, trying to un understand how it incorporates the technology. And then I saw virtual reality emerge. And that's what changed everything. I hopped on board a little company called Oculus, a little unknown company there. Uh, built some of the first VR films uh, and, and stories while I was there um, using a lot of new technology. Um, and then, of course, uh, was lucky enough to have this thing called, uh, this little company called Facebook come in and acquire our company. And that changed the nature of the entire medium. And what it did was it accelerated the advancement of virtual reality um, by, I think, about 10 years from where we were just only a few years ago. And uh, so just a, a little over a year ago, uh, we trekked off and created a new company to take advantage of this new medium. And this company is called Penrose. That's the company that I'm at right now. Our mission and our goal in life is to define the next generation of human storytelling uh, in this tradition that we've described. So um, let me dive into a little bit more. So uh, we've made two films so far. Uh, the first one's called The Rose and I, um, homage to Le Petit Prince. And uh, this was uh, featured at Sundance only uh, earlier this year. And our second film, which is yet to be released very soon, uh, is a film called Allumette. And Allumette is based loosely inspired by The Little Match Girl by Hans Christian Andersen. And it's a film about an orphan girl in, in a city floating in the clouds. We're a relatively young company, and our films are just starting. But we're very lucky to have received some, some very nice reactions uh, from the press, uh, some early uh, uh, press saying some nice things about some of the work that we put together. Um, and of course, uh, you know, some, some, uh, some nice things from USA Today and, and TechCrunch and things like that. So, um, but other, more than this, it's hard to show you what it's like to be inside of VR, uh, but the best, next best thing I can do is give a video and some insight into, um, into what it was like creating this video. Stories are the way that we as humans have figured out how to transmit learning and culture over generations. When I saw virtual reality reemerge a few years ago, and I finally saw it come to fruition, I realized that this is, in fact, that next major medium of human storytelling. There's that human element that's really what drives everything. It's, it's all about bringing the human into the virtual world and trying to wipe away the technology and, and bring in the humanity. Alumet is a story about love and sacrifice. It's an incredibly deeply personal story and a deeply personal experience. And as you see Alumet's story unfold, you start to realize what's happened to her and your empathy for her only grows. At Penrose Studios, we have a native VR creation tool that's really helpful for artists to work directly in virtual reality to create our assets. We can't rely on the camera angle to help compose a story and help influence the audience. We actually have to design a set that could be seen from different angles. The set becomes a character to me. This medium is so new that it's almost like we're trying to paint a picture, but we're also trying to design the paintbrush at the same time. Some of the challenges with VR have been some of the most exciting aspects of VR. I feel truly lucky and blessed to be working with the incredible people at Penrose Studios. And as people around the world see Alumet, I hope they fall in love with her in the same way that we have. <clears throat> so.
So that's a sneak peek into what it's like to make a VR movie. And uh, that's some of the wonderful people I get the privilege of going to work with uh, every day. Uh, it's a really incredible experience. So this is the art of virtual reality. That's one of the big things um, that we've been emphasizing. Um, but what else? You know, why is this industry uh, garnered so much attention, and why are people paying so much attention to it? And um, this is sort of um, one of our views as to um, where this industry is going. So uh, we talked a lot about why it's in a, a new art form, why it's that next generation of storytelling. But in addition to that, what's fascinating about virtual and augmented reality is that we, in fact, think that this is the next major computing platform. So in the last 60 years, we've had about five major computing platforms. It started with the mini computer, um, or sorry, the, um, the mainframe in the 60s, uh, followed by, about a decade later, the mini computer. Then we had the personal computer emerge, uh, followed by the era of the desktop internet, and now we live in the era of the mobile internet. And, and as you can see from this graph, we've had to graph the number of devices for each era on a logarithmic curve. Uh, because every single major iteration has generated 10 times the number of users as the previous iteration. And our belief, um, and the belief of many now, increasingly many, is that virtual and augmented reality together as a single medium will in fact inhabit the next major shift in computing. Uh, it will in fact be that next major platform. Um, so this is what is really exciting for us, right? We think of this not just as a, sort of a, a gimmick or a small little thing. We, in fact, think this, this will, in fact, be the, the next platform. And that's a really exciting uh, shift. Um, and of course, with the coming of new platforms, you basically have the transformation and the opportunity to create large companies. All the major companies that have come about in the last several decades have come about during platform shifts. This is when the time of greatest opportunity is. And this is why we're so excited around um, this evolution and this transformation as well. Um, so market size forecast, how big will this be? Um, even investment banks like Goldman Sachs, you know, UBS, Piper Jaffray, uh, a lot of companies are now throwing their hat in the ring, are starting to estimate how big this could be. And this is specifically some of Goldman Sachs' estimates. And they have various uh, things over the next decade, how large they think this market will be. But it's anywhere from 23 billion all the way up to over 180 billion. Which, by the way, at the upside case, would make this market larger than the entire US advertising industry, which has been around for decades and has been dominated by large companies like Omnicom and WPP, WPP Group. And it's really fascinating to see that an entirely new market will emerge dominated by uh, entirely new entrants, usually speaking, given that this is a disruptive innovation. So um, going back in time for a little bit. So um, when I was at Oculus uh, several years ago and just starting out, we were really the only consumer-grade virtual reality in town. But if you fast forward now, just a few years later, suddenly there are now um, several major platforms and a lot of other platforms even than, than they're on this page representing billions of dollars of invested capital from some of the largest technology players uh, in the entire world. And this is a really exciting time, especially this period, this period of a year where you're seeing the launches of several of the largest platforms out there uh, launching their main consumer products. Um, but of course, the content will be the key bottleneck. It's why we're putting our focus uh, where uh, we think there will be that bottleneck. And so if you think about this entire layer, we think of this very important layer as the hardware layer, um, which of course is increasingly becoming sophisticated, but also starting to converge more and more, uh, the different platforms that are out there. And so over time, we suspect and expect there to be uh, a growing importance of the software layer and the content layer, which is why we're putting our focus on that layer of the value chain. So if you fast forward, well, OK, that's our theory. Um, but of course, also, when you think about um, some of the forecasts uh, that are out there, there are you know, several forecasts. And the question is, who knows who's right? But if you look at a lot of them, a lot of them forecast, of course, that uh, similar to other platforms that have emerged, whether in personal computing or in mobile, spending should shift from hardware, where a large part of the dollars are being spent today, this year, 2016, uh, the head-mounted displays or the VR headsets, um, over time in the next five years to a, a dominance in terms of consumer spend on the software side, uh, which you know, should be no surprise when looking into the past, 
but it's not where a lot of the uh, investment necessarily is happening today in this moment. So uh, shift going back to the creation part, uh, VR content, so this content part, which is so important and will become very big, is actually very difficult. It's not the easiest thing to do. Um, virtual reality is a brand new language. And because of that, there are so many mispronunciations. Uh, it's like you learn how to speak French, and then all of a sudden you have to go learn how to speak Swahili. Uh, it's really difficult to do, and it's almost better if you just knew how to speak Swahili in the first place. Um, you know, or that was your, sort of your first language. So that's one of the biggest challenges of existing companies to try to adapt to uh, this, new, um, this new platform. You know, uh, it's uh, going, diving a little bit into how we create and what we do to do that. You know, we take this sort of strange technology of virtual reality where you put a big goggle and a headset on, and uh, we sort of try to create these worlds and stories that really relate to you in a human way. Uh, there's a lot of talk about that today and a lot of the talks about empathy and being able to relate to you on the human level. So when we think about our films, we think a lot about, you know, well, there, we're in outer space, but what if that asteroid is made out of this, you know, clay pot uh, instead of being made out of whatever asteroids are made out of? And so that's something that we, um, you know, we, we strive a lot for. It's something we carried over into our second film, Alley Met, uh, which is sort of this fantastical city floating in the clouds, uh, this feeling of sort of clay and ceramic textures, uh, which pervaded everything from the, set, the town to our set right here, you know, the, um, the ship, the floating ship and things like that. Um, so it's been a real pleasure to sort of explore what strikes at the human core uh, in a medium as new as virtual reality. And we are learning uh, about how to do this uh, day to day, every day, uh, with just a really fantastic and great group of people. Uh, so that's all I got. But uh, thank you so much. I really appreciate uh, uh, being here. And it's been a pleasure talking to you all about VR.